I'll Give You the Sun, Episode 105, Lies, written by Grant Torre, based on I'll Give You the Sun, by Jandy Nelson. Exterior, Brian's driveway, early morning. The faint color of a winter morning peeks out into the harsh black night as Brian wearily brings his bags to his mom's minivan. Even the air feels black and backstabbing after Jude went into the closet with Brian. The car drives off as Brian looks regretfully towards Noah's window. He must have gotten tangled up in her hair, just like the asshat surfers and little kids and poodles. Exterior, sweet wine house, continuous. Crisp early morning turns into a beautiful sunny Northern California day. Children playing outside on the street as Noah stares achingly out his window at Brian's house. He must have gotten tangled up in her light, in her normal, something only Jude has. Interior, Noah's room, continuous. Noah sits on a stool at the edge of his messy room. His sketch pad lays on the floor with three small trash bags filled with torn up drawings of Brian. Noah's trance is broken by the running shower and Jude's humming. He slowly gets up and walks to his door and sees Jude's door open. Without hesitation, he enters. Interior, Jude's room, continuous. Noah walks straight to Jude's computer, knowing exactly what he's looking for. He immediately sees an instant message chat. Space boy, thinking about you. Rapunzel, me too. Space boy, come here, right this minute. Rapunzel, haven't perfected my teleporting. Space boy, I'll work on it. They're in love, like black vultures and termites, yes, Turtle doves and swans aren't the only animals that mate for life. Ugly, toilet-licking kermites and death-eating vultures do too. Title card. Exterior. Fire escape. Day. Noah sits on a fire escape with his sketch pad, looking down on a class of art students scattered around the courtyard, carving stone statues. Despite trying to stay incognito, Noah is endlessly comfortable. He effortlessly sits up and pays attention to the chaos below, as if he could stay here forever. Exterior. Guillermo's studio, continuous. Guillermo joyously emerges from the inside of his studio, practically dancing on air as he speaks into a phone. Hurry, hurry, my love! He kisses two of his own fingers and touches the phone as only a hopeless romantic would, before slipping it into his pocket. As he faces away from the students, his face slips into a smile that seems to contain every smile in the world. He turns back towards his focused students and raises his hands as silence descends on the courtyard. Not even the birds, the wind, nor the buzz of a fly can interrupt his press-down mute button on the world. I talk very much about bravery. I say to you, carving is not for cowards. Cowards stick to clay, yes? The artists laugh in a way that only teachers can get from their students. He grabs a matchstick from his pocket and dramatically strikes it on a column before lighting a cigarette. I tell you, you must take risks in my studio. I tell you not to be the timid. I tell you to make the choices, and make the mistakes, big, terrible, reckless mistakes, really screw it all up. I tell you it is the only way. I say this, yes, but still I see so many people afraid to cut in. Today, this changes. Guillermo walks over to a short-haired blonde student. As he moves around, the students are clearly in awe. Hmm. May I, Melinda? The girl nods politely, avoiding eye contact with her teacher as Guillermo takes a long drag on the cigarette before dropping it on the ground. We find your woman, yes? Guillermo closes his eyes and drags his fingers across the stone. His fingers do the seeing for him, pushing harder and lighter, faster and slower, as his fingers traverse the stone. Okay. Without hesitation, he grabs the power drill and begins cutting. As dust covers him, the students, and most importantly for Noah, the art. Exterior, fire escape, continuous. The sun begins to set as dust fills the air and Guillermo continues to drill. So Noah finishes a sketch of the statues in the courtyard and shimmies down the fire escape to head home. Exterior, studio driveway, continuous. Noah clumsily falls off the last part of the fire escape, but shakes himself off before checking to see if anyone saw his latest awkward fall. As he looks around, he notices a red car parked in front of the house. It looks just like his mom's car. He looks to the plates and notices it is his mom's car. As he gets closer, he notices his mom, bent over the passenger seat. He knocks on the window as she springs up, but looks at Noah with a faint smile before rolling down the window. You scared me, honey. She is dressed in bright colors, glittery purple scarf, yellow river-like dress, and colored bracelets. She's usually dressed like a black and white movie, but not now. 
Noah eyes her suspiciously, but not wanting to question her directly. What were you doing bent over like that? I dropped something. What? What what? What did you drop? Oh, my earring. Noah immediately notices that his mom has both of her earrings on. He furrows his eyebrows, but quickly snaps back. Too late, though, because his mom sees his suspicion. Another earring. I wanted to change pairs. Why? Why what? For the first time, Mom and Noah seem to need translators, speaking languages from two distant planets. Why did you want to change pairs? I don't know. I just did. Get in, honey. Noah hesitates, then gets in. Nobody knew he was coming here to watch the art students, yet his mom acts as if this was the plan all along. Interior. Car. Moments later. There is uncomfortable silence as both Mom and Noah refuse to acknowledge each other. Mom nervously rotates the bracelets on her wrist as she drives home while Noah stares out the passenger window. Without looking back at her, he breaks the silence. What were you doing that far from home? Well, I could ask you the same thing, mister. You're a long way from home, aren't you? I have a car, at least. I went for a walk to sketch. Mom is about to question Noah further, but her cell phone vibrates in her lap. She looks at the number and hits ignore. Sweat plasters her forehead. Work. Exterior. Driveway. Continuous. Mom pulls into a driveway and hops out of the car. Noah stares at her in disbelief. Well, aren't you coming in? Mom turns towards the door and realizes this is not their house. She is horrified, but manages to turn the embarrassment into a gleeful smile, like a preschooler caught eating glue. Where's my head? Mom hops back in the car as the two drive off in complete silence. Montage. Various. Interior. Sweet wine house. Day. Rain pours down as the roof begins to leak into buckets, and Noah continues to draw. The end of the world begins with rain. Exterior. Sweet wine deck. Day. Under light rain, Mom smokes a cigarette with a phone to her ear, swaying slightly but not saying a word. September washes away, then October. By November, even Dad can't stay on top of it. Exterior, front porch, evening. Mom holds an umbrella, humming as she reads a book in the rain. I find her everywhere, doing things she never does, looking ways she's never looked. Interior, Mom's study, night. Mom sits in front of her computer with a blank Word document, but she stares up at the ceiling like it's filled with stars. She doesn't see me. She doesn't see Jude. She especially doesn't see Dad. End of montage. Interior. Sweet wine house. Evening. Noah returns from his new hobby to accompany the three inches from his latest growth spurt. Running. The hallway provides relief from the rain and he kicks off his shoes and grabs the towel waiting for him in the doorway as he heads towards his room. As he's about to enter, he kicks over the bucket catching the water leaking from the ceiling so it spills onto Jude's carpet. Interior. Noah's room. Continuous. Noah is drying off his hair and checking his phone until he sees his dad sitting on his bed. Storm catch you? I've never seen anything like this rain. Time for you to build that ark, eh? Noah doesn't mind this joke, despite hearing it every day, few weeks at school, so he softly chuckles at his dad. Totally got me. You're going to be bigger than me. Noah beams with pride at the thought he'll be taking up more room than his father. You think? Yep. The rate you're going lately sure seems like it. Dad surveys Noah's room, taking in the artwork plastering the walls as if he is seeing it for the first time. With the way their relationship has been going, it may in fact be the first time. So I uh, thought we could, you know, get some dinner, have a little father-son time. Noah's face stiffens. Hasn't he already had the talk? What more could his dad want to tell him? No talks. Promise. Just some grub. I need some uh, mano a mano. With me? Who else? I mean, you're my son. Dad springs up from the bed to get ready, and Noah is reeling. This is the first time he remembers his dad being interested in his life. Interior. Sweet wine house. Continuous. Dad grabs his car keys as Noah slips on clean shoes by the door. Dad pulls a suit jacket off a coat hook and sees a second hanging next to it. He stares out of the second and has a thought. For you. He hands the second coat to Noah, who hesitates, then puts it on. It fits perfectly. The two softly laugh at this simple moment that they're sharing for the first time. Thanks. Where's Mom, by the way? Got me. Interior. Restaurant. Later. Dad and Noah are seated at a table in a nice restaurant. The type parents only bring their children for fancy birthday dinners or when their grandparents are in town. But Dad brought Noah for no reason. So, um, Mom showed me some of your sketch pads. I, I hope that's okay. But 
I was blown away. I had no idea you were brilliant. Noah's caught off guard by his dad taking an interest in his art, so takes another forkful of food to avoid responding, but between bites, succumbs. Thanks. Yeah, I thought you knew. I mean, I knew you liked drawing, but I didn't know you were actually good. You're definitely getting into CSA. Well, I wouldn't say that. It's hard to... No. Believe me, they'd be idiots not to take you. Who would have thought my one and only son actually talented? I mean, I'm so proud of you. Noah still doesn't know how to react, but manages to crack a small smile. This father-son bonding is new to him, and he's acting like a kid at his first practice for a sport he's never heard of. Thanks. I mean, I'm glad you like my art. Yeah, I can't wait to see your final portfolio. It's all I'm saying. You're so lucky. Your mom has so much passion for art. It's contagious, isn't it? Ready to switch? Noah lifts his half-eaten chocolate dessert to switch with his dad, but the two hesitate. Nah, forget it. Let's get two more. How often do, do we do this? Noah can't help but contain his happiness and breaks into a smile as he nods yes and looks around, hoping that everyone in the restaurant sees him and his dad eating together, having a good time, being normal. Interior. Car. Later. The mood in this car ride is the polar opposite of Noah's ride with his mom. The conversation flows quickly, overlapping one another as Dad and Noah gush like teenage girls at a slumber party. Okay, well did you know that giraffes can eat over 75 pounds of food each day and sleep only 30 minutes? Do I look like an idiot? Does the man who made you look like an idiot? And did you know that they have the longest tails of any land mammal and 20-inch tongues? Of course I knew that. You have to try harder to stump me. All right, okay. Let me think. I got it. Have you heard of microscopic water bears? That's a lie. It has to be a lie. No. No. They're real. Yeah, NASA is thinking of sending them to space because they can survive minus 328 degrees Fahrenheit to 303 Fahrenheit, can cope with 1,000 times the radiation it would take to kill a human, and can be revived after being dried out for 10 years. Sounds like Grandma. The two break out <laughs> into their biggest laugh yet, since they both hate the late Grandma Sweetwater, despite Jude and Mom's uncanny <laughs> obsession with her. After almost choking of laughter, the two sigh out together. I didn't know you like animal shows. What do you mean? Why do you think you like them? That's all you and I did together when you were little. Don't you remember? Noah clearly doesn't remember. His smile fades as he thinks of all the memories that must have crowded that one out. The times his dad threw him in the ocean to teach him how to swim or forced him to watch sports games. Oh yeah, how could anyone forget? The car pulls into the empty garage. Mom's still gone. Dad sighs. <clears throat> I had this dream last night. Your mother was walking through the house. And as she did, everything fell off the shelves and from the walls. Books, pictures, knickknacks, everything. All I could do was follow her around and try to put everything back in its place. Did you? Did you get everything back where it belonged? Don't know. Woke up. Sometimes you think you know things, know things very deeply, only you realize you don't know a damn thing. Noah flashes back to his time with Brian, a time where everything made so much sense, yet nothing made sense at all. I totally get what you mean, Dad. You do? Already? Noah nods. Guess we've lots of catching up to do, huh? The two get out of the car, and as they're about to walk inside, Dad squeezes Noah's shoulder. So are you uh, still seeing Heather? Cute girl. Kind of. Uh, yeah, she's my girlfriend. Noah freezes from this lie, but Dad's eyes light up as he gives Noah the dumb, you sly dog expression. We're going to have to have a little talk. Me and you, aren't we, son? 
14 years old. Noah pauses outside as his dad enters the house, immobilized by the realization he's living a lie, but a lie he had to tell because he's never been this close to his dad before. This is his time to be normal. Interior, sweet wine house, continuous. Noah heads for his room and notices that Jude kicked the bucket to flood his room. Unsurprised, Noah grabs the towel he was using earlier to wipe off his floor and sees the calendar hanging on his wall. Today is Dad's birthday. He grabs a sketch pad and pastels and starts sketching. Interior, living room, later. Dad is watching a college football game as Noah enters with his drawing and the words, Happy Birthday, written on the bottom. He looks down at the drawing, unsure if it's the right gift for his dad, but hands it over anyway. Dad looks down at the drawing and then directly up at Noah. Thanks. The word comes out all scrunched up, like it was hard to get out. No one remembered, not even Mom. She forgot the turkey on Thanksgiving, too. Right as he says it, Noah realizes just how terrible the metaphor was. Noah sits down as his dad puts his arm on Noah's shoulder. End act one. Interior. Living room. Day. Mom and Dad and Noah and Jude sit on couches facing each other on opposite sides of their coffee table. It's eerily silent, sounds the constant rhythm of raindrops falling outside. Mom and Dad sit together, but too far apart. A small gap between them saying everything that both are unwilling to say. Until... I'm going to be moving out for a bit to Lost Cove Hotel. Just for a bit. Wait, why? For how long? Not long. Just so I uh, have some space. Space from what? From us? No, not from you. Your father and I, we... Well, he'll be renting out a studio apartment there by the week until we can figure some issues out. What issues? We still love each other very much. We just need some space right now. Benjamin? Silence again, except the rain, which has increased with intensity. Nobody is saying anything, so Noah looks at Jude, who is fighting tears, but losing. Dad opens his mouth to speak, but can't find the words. There are no words. I'm going with Dad! Me too! Noah's outburst surprises himself. Who knew he would ever want to choose Dad over perfect, art-loving Mom? Dad lifts his head and forces himself to look at Noah and Jude in the eyes. As he speaks, his voice is flimsy. You'll stay here with your mother. Kids, it's temporary. Holding back tears, Dad gets up and slowly walks out of the room as both Jude and Noah stare down the traitor, their protector who just crossed enemy lines. Mom. Jude gets up and walks over to stand over Mom. Her eyes are filled with tears. How could you? Jude doesn't wait for a response and runs out of the room after Dad, tears streaming down her face harder than the rain falling outside. Dad, don't go! Make her leave! Noah is unable to move, but finds the strength to walk back to his room as he finds the words he can say to Mom. Are you leaving us? Never. Mom grabs Noah's shoulders and squeezes them tight, just like Dad did a week ago. You hear me, Noah? I will never leave you and your sister. This is between your father and me. It has nothing to do with you kids. Noah can't stay strong any longer and leans into Mom's arms as tears fall down his face. My boy, my tender boy, my dream boy, everything's going to be okay. It'll all be okay. Interior, sweet wine house, evening. Noah and Jude gather at the window, watching Dad walk his suitcase to the car. The rain pours down, almost begging him to stay. He tosses the small suitcase in the trunk and slams it shut. I don't think there's anything in it. There is. I checked. One thing. A drawing of you and him. Nothing else. Not even a toothbrush. Interior. Noah's room. Night. Noah lies in bed, unable to sleep, staring into the darkness as much as the darkness is staring at him. His eyes are swollen, drained of their tears. Jude slowly opens the door and sees Noah is awake. She walks towards the bed and Noah flips the pillow so Jude won't see the puddles from his tears. The two lay side by side on their backs, looking up at the ceiling. I wished for it. Three times. Three different birthdays. I wished he would leave. Jude turns on her side to face Noah and touches his arm. I once wished for Mom to die. Noah turns on his side just as Jude did. They face each other, and Noah forces himself to speak. 
Take it back. I didn't take it back in time. How? I don't know. Grandma would know how. Well, that's a lot of help. <laughs> <laughs> the two suddenly burst into laughter at the exact same moment. The cathartic, gasping, snorting kind of laughter. They have to put the pillows over their faces to calm down so Mom doesn't hear and decide they think Dad being kicked out is the funniest thing that has ever happened to them. Once they're lying back down, Jude shuffles over to the bed to sit on Noah. Okay, now that I have your undivided attention, are you ready? She bounces a few times, creating her own sort of a drum roll for the big news. Get off me. Nothing happened. You hear me? I've tried to tell you so many times, but you won't listen. N-O-T-H-I-N-G. Brian's your friend. I get it. In the closet, he told me something about a globular cluster, I think. He talked about how amazing your drawings are, for Pete's sake. It's true, I was so mad at you because of Mom, and because you totally stole all my friends, and because you threw away that no. I know you did that, and it really sucked, Noah, because that was like the only Sam sculpture I ever made that I thought was maybe good enough for Mom to see. So yeah, I might have had Brian's name on a piece of paper in my hand at that party. But nothing happened, okay? I did not steal your, your, your best friend, okay? Okay, now get off me. Who's Space Boy then? Huh? Space Boy, on the computer? Spy much? Jeez, that's Michael, you know, Zephyr. Space Boy's the name of some song he's into. You like Zephyr? Maybe. I don't know yet. Noah's mind speeds around, rearranging everything from the past few months. He's excited for Brian to get back from school, so excited in painting Brian in his mind once again that he forgets Jude is right next to him, until... So, are you and Brian, like, in love with each other or something? What? No, God, Jude! Can I have a friend? I totally hooked up with Heather, if you didn't notice. Noah pushes Jude off him and turns away from her to shield the guilt in his eyes. Another lie. Okay, fine. It's just... What? Nothing. So you can stop hating me now. They both pause because they did hate each other. Noah and Jude, the inseparable twins, let a boy come between them. Noah rolls back over towards Jude. I never hated you. I'm really... Me too. Jude grabs Noah's hand and the two lay facing the ceiling, breathing, taking in the realization that in this moment, they may not have Dad but they do have each other. I've probably seen all your sand sculptures. They're freaking amazing. This catches Jude off guard. She's speechless. Noah, really? They can't see each other, but both break out in a warm smile. The twins are back in action. Noah, I still love you the most. Me too. Interior, sweet wine house, day. Mom is baking with the radio on in the kitchen. She looks like the perfect housewife, apron and all. The smell of pies and turnovers permeate the house, drawing Noah out from his room to taste the baked goods. Is that you? Come here, please. Interior, Jude's room, continuous. Jude sits on her bed, reading Grandma Sweetwine's Bible, trying to figure out some magic that will bring Dad home. She grabs a scarf next to her and tosses it to Noah. Here, it's time you see the bedpost. What? It's the only solution. I need a reminder not to be weak and go into the kitchen. I'm not giving mom the satisfaction of me eating one bite. How come she decides to become Julia Chow now? You shouldn't eat anything she makes either. I know you got into that chicken pot pie after we came home from dad's last night. I saw. Promise not one morsel? Noah nods to comply, but it's a complete lie. The pastries are delicious. I mean it, Noah. Okay, I said yes. Only one risk, so I can turn the pages. Noah begins tying her to the bedpost, but stares out the door as the timer goes off, and Mom makes the distinct groan one makes when sniffing freshly baked goods. It smells like pie, or turnovers, or crumble. God, I love crumbles. Of all fairness, who even knew she knew how to bake? Noah finishes tying the knot and heads for the door, but Jude is both suspicious and jealous. Stay strong. Interior, kitchen, continuous. Noah immediately breaks his promise and heads straight for the kitchen to see beautifully baked apple pie sitting on the counter. Next to it, Mom is singing while rolling dough, her face and apron sprinkled with flowers. You're happy. How come you didn't cook like this when Dad lived here? Mom sighs. 
understanding that what Noah is really asking is, why don't you miss him? Why are you happier without Dad? I don't know. Here, have a piece of pie and a slice of turnover. I won't tell your sister. Mom prepares a hefty plate for Noah, who walks it back to the table as Jude walks in, plants her feet, and presses her hips, and dramatically rolls her eyes. What's your problem, Noah? Noah is caught mid-bite. How do you get free anyways? Free? I tied her up so she wouldn't be tempted to come in here and eat. <laughs> Jude, I know you're furious with me. It doesn't mean you can't have a turnover for breakfast. Never. Jude walks past the line of pastries for a sad-looking bowl and an old box of Cheerios. She looks in the fridge for milk, but can't find anyone. I think I used up all the milk. Of course you did. Jude grabs her milkless bowl of cereal and plops down at the table next to Noah. She starts crunching, and as Mom turns her back to keep rolling dough, Noah offers her a piece of turnover, which Jude shovels in her mouth. In this exact moment, time stops. I knocked. Brian has returned. Taller, broader, with short hair, Noah involuntarily jumps up, then sits down, then jumps up again. Jude kicks him under the table and gives Noah a look that says, Stop being a freak. Before she smiles at Brian with his mouth stuffed with turnover. Well, hello. She wipes her hands on her apron and walks towards Brian to shake his hand. Welcome back. Thank you. Good to be back. We can smell what you're baking all the way down at our house. We were salivating over our cornflakes. Well, please, help yourself. I'm going through a cooking phase, and you can certainly bring something back for your mother. Maybe later. Brian looks at the counter before his eyes travel to Noah. He licks his bottom lips, and the gesture, so familiar, makes Noah's heart lurch. Brian walks over to Noah, who finally decides to stand up, does nothing but look into his eyes. Stare much? That was the first thing he said to Noah when they met, and Noah melts on the inside. Brian's lips curl into a half-smile as his tongue rests on the precipice between his front teeth. You look different. Me? Dude, you're huge. I think you're bigger than me. How'd that happen? Yeah, super far from the toes now. The two crack up. Their weirdness is back together. Back to last summer. Back to the woods. After settling down, Brian turns to Jude, who finally swallowed the pastry. Hey. She waves back and goes back to her milkless Cheerios. There is clearly no romantic chemistry between them, and Noah finally sees this. Ready? Noah looks at the window, and it looks like there it could pour at any minute, but they have to get out of there. We're going searching for meteorites. Jude and Mom are confused, but the two boys run out of the house faster than either can comment. Exterior, woods, continuous. In a flash, Noah and Brian are out the door, across the street, and into the woods. The two are running for no reason and laughing for no reason, and totally out of breath and out of their minds. After they're far enough into the woods, Brian catches Noah by the shirt, whips him around, and with one strong hand flat against Noah's chest, he pushes him against a tree, and the two kiss. Their hands are exploring each other's bodies in the most awkward, teenage way possible, stumbling into and out of pockets, cheekily pulling each other's shirts off. Then Brian pulls away. Fuck. I've wanted to do that for so long. So long. You're just... Brian brushes Noah's face with the back of his hand, a gesture so romantic that Noah can't help but close his eyes in ecstasy. God, it's happening. Yeah, it is. We're them. Who? Noah ignores Brian as the two continue to kiss. Noah bites Brian's lip, sending a shiver down his spine and a moan out of his mouth. He's kissing Brian like he kissed Heather, but for real this time. Brian stops and pulls away one more time. No one can know. Ever. A bomb has dropped. Noah steps back, and everything seems to go silent. It'd be the end. Of everything. My athletic scholarship at Forrester. I'm the assistant captain of the varsity team as a sophomore, and... Noah interrupts him by kissing him and then grabbing his shirt and pulling it off, before pulling off his own. Noah kisses him deeply, pushing him back against the tree. Noah! Noah! No one's gonna find out. Don't worry. Interior. Hotel room. Evening. Noah, Jude, and Dad are gathered around a small table, eating Chinese takeout and celebrating Christmas. The gifts have already been opened, and the three are finishing up their food. The conversation has been mindlessly flowing. Not awkward, but certainly uninspired. So yeah, I'm not a traitor because I refuse to eat all of Mom's pastries. But Noah over here can't get enough. Are you kidding me? You just eat them when she's not looking. Dad chuckles with his mouth full of before swallowing and settling the fight. You two both eat her pastries. God, would die for one of her turnovers right now. All I have here is a 
rotation of takeout and microwave dinners. I mean, we can bring you something. Maybe one of her pies you can taste? No, no. It's fine. But you two need to enjoy your mom's company. And that means eating her pies. You know I still love your mother. Noah and Jude don't really understand, so continue to stuff their faces with chow mein and spicy chicken. So Noah, what have you been up to lately? You've been awfully quiet tonight? Noah almost misses the question entirely. He's been thinking about Brian all day, every day. Uh, just drawing and painting and hanging out with Brian. Oh, Brian's back? Yeah, just for a bit. And not right now. He's up at some Buddhist retreat for the holidays. But he's back tomorrow. Noah lights up when talking about Brian. His voice a little brighter and his eyes a little wider. Well, enjoy your friend when you can. And I like seeing you get out of your room a little more. Jude sends a knowing look at Noah, pursing her lips and crunching her eyebrows. Noah sends her a look back, trying to keep her off the trail of knowing what's exactly happening between him and Brian. What? Oh, yeah, me too. Dad keeps talking to Jude, but Noah can't focus. All he can think about is Brian coming back. Interior, Noah's room, evening. Brian has returned and is sitting at Noah's desk watching a meteor shower on YouTube. Meanwhile, Noah is propped up on his bed sketching a picture of Brian looking at the computer, but with stars and the planets storming out of the screen and into the room. Give it up. No way you can beat this. I had to go to an all-day sit with my mom and then sleep on the floor on a mat and eat gross gruel for Christmas dinner. I got a prayer from the monks as my only present. A prayer for peace, I repeat, and all they sit. Me. I couldn't say anything or do anything for eight hours. And then gruel and a prayer? And I even had to wear a robe, a frickin' dress. And what's worse is the whole time I couldn't stop thinking about... Brian trembles, and Noah knows exactly what he's talking about. It was so painful, dude. Luckily, we had these weird pillow things on our laps, so no one knew. Sucked. And didn't suck, too. Noah drops his pencil. He couldn't stop thinking about it, either. So, who were the them you mentioned, anyways? Noah's confused, but then remembers the day they first kissed, when he said, were them. I saw these guys making out at that party. The party where you hooked up with Heather? Yeah, that party. They were... What? I don't know, amazing or something. Why? I decided to give up on my fingers if... If what? If it could have been us, right? I saw them too. Noah looks away but cracks a half smile and nods in agreement. It'd be hard to draw with no fingers. I'd manage. Noah closes his eyes, unable to contain the feeling inside him when he opens them up and sees Brian gazing at his bare stomach since his shirt has ridden up, then lower where there is no hiding how he's feeling. Brian's hand travels down to his own as he looks at the computer, then back at Noah. Want to? Totally. Their hands go to their belts, unbuckling. Noah can't really see from across the room, but watches Brian's neck arch before he turns to face Noah. They're looking at each other's eyes, locked more intimately than even during their first kiss in the woods. They're staring and furiously breathing when Mom bursts into the room, waving a magazine. This is the best essay I've ever read on Picasso. You are going to... Mom's confused gaze darts from Noah to Brian. Both their hands are fumbling, shoving, zipping. Oh! 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 She averts her eyes and quickly leaves the room. Just like that, she's gone. Like she was never there. Like she hadn't seen a thing. End Act Two. Interior. Noah's room. Continuous. Brian is walking around the room with his hands covering his face, hyperventilating. Oh God, oh God, oh God! Noah is still sitting on his bed, unsure of what to do. He is mortified that his mom saw him with Brian, but Brian's reaction is worrying him even more now. Brian, maybe she didn't see. So, at my old school, there was this kid on the baseball team. People thought, I don't know, they saw he went to these, this website or something. They made it impossible for him to play. Every day they found another way to mess with him. Then one Friday after school, they locked him in the storage closet all night long and the whole next day, a tiny, dark, disgusting, airless space. His parents thought he was at the away game and someone told the coaches he was sick, so no one even looked for him. No one knew he was trapped in there. He was really good too. Probably the best player on the team. Or could have been. 
And he didn't even do anything. This guy just went to these sites and someone saw. Do you get it? Do you get what it mean, would mean for me? The assistant captain. I want to be captain next year, so maybe I can graduate early. No scholarship. No nothing. These guys aren't evolved. They're not from Northern California. They don't do all day sits or draw pictures. It's brutal in the locker room. No one will find out. You don't know that. Anyone could have seen us the other day, Noah. Anyone. I can't get forced off this team. Can't lose my athletic scholarship. We have no money. Brian approaches Noah and stands in front of him and looks in his eyes. Noah's unsure whether Brian is about to kiss him or punch him. Brian doesn't know either. It's done with us. It has to be. Okay? Noah nods, unsure of what else to do. Brian keeps looking at him for a second more before grabbing his things and heading towards the window. He opens the window and gives one last look towards Noah. He wants to say something, but can't. Just as quickly, he jumps out the window and runs back to his house. Noah is alone for a moment. Then there is a knock. Noah, I'm coming in. Noah throws the covers over his body with his head barely peeking out. Mom comes and sits down on the bed next to him, but neither knows where to start. I'd like to talk to you, honey. Noah cringes at the thought of talking to Mom about Brian. He rolls over, but Mom grabs his shoulder and looks at him directly in the eye. Love's so complicated, Noah, isn't it? Noah goes rigid. Love? It's okay what you're feeling. It's natural. Brian can barely breathe, but takes in a sharp, quick breath before yelling. It's all your fault! What is, honey? Everything! Don't you see? You've crushed Dad. He banished him like a leper. He loves you. How do you think he feels all alone in that dying room, breathing gray air and eating cold, stale pizza and watching shows about aardvarks while you cook feasts and wear circus clothes and hum all the time and have the sun follow you around in the pouring rain? How do you think that makes him feel? Who knows if he, if he even has a soul left thanks to you? Mom is crushed, but doesn't show it. Her situation is more complicated than Noah can understand, and she has to stay strong for Noah. What do you mean by that? I don't understand. Maybe you stomped it to nothing, and now he's hollow and empty, a shell with no turtle inside. Why would you say that? Do you feel that way sometimes? I'm not talking about me. And you know what else? You're not special. You're just like everyone else. You don't float or walk through walls, and you never will. Noah? I always thought you blew in from somewhere so cool, but you're just regular. And you don't make anyone happy anymore like you used to. You make everyone miserable. Noah, are you done? Mom, I am. Listen to me. I didn't come in here to talk about me or about me and Dad. We can have those conversations, I promise, but not now. You didn't see anything! Guys do that, they do! Whole basketball teams do that! Circle jerks, that's what you called, you know! Noah drops his head in his hands, filling them with tears. Mom grabs him close as he cries. She waits a moment, then grabs Noah's face and lifts it to her eyes. Listen to me. It takes a lot of courage to be true to yourself, true to your heart. You always have to be very brave that way, and I pray you always will be. It's your responsibility, Noah. Remember that. Mom kisses Noah's forehead as he continues to cry. She gets up and walks back out the door as Noah covers himself with the sheets once again. Interior, sweet wine house, morning. Noah wakes up in the same clothes he was in with Brian the night before. His eyes are still red from crying. He looks out the window at Brian's house and Brian's light is still off. Noah walks to the kitchen but stops as he hears mom on the phone. He stands close to her door to eavesdrop. I need to see you now. It can't wait. I've been up all night thinking. Something happened with Noah yesterday. It's silent as the person on the other end speaks. Noah is betrayed as he thinks Mom is about to tell Dad about him and Brian. He steps closer to the door. Okay, but not at the studio. At the Wooden Bird. Yeah, one hour is perfect. Mom hangs up and Noah considers acting like he didn't hear anything. But he can't let Dad find out now that they're just acting like normal father and son. He knocks. Come in. Interior. Mom's room. Continuous. Noah enters Mom's room and sees Mom sitting on her bed with her mascara smudged around her eyes like she's been crying all night. Morning, sweetheart. 
She manages to crack half a smile and gets up to open the window curtains. As she walks away, she attempts to wipe her face, but Noah sees her. Where are you going? I have a doctor's appointment. How did you know I was going out? I just assumed because you weren't up early baking. Mom smiles at the thought and heads to her mirror where she starts cleaning her face and applying new makeup for the day. Noah watches her change from the sad, mascara-smudged morning mom to the woman he's used to seeing. He stares at her, but Mom catches him in the mirror. You look upset, Noah. I don't want you to mention to Dad what you saw. Not that you saw anything, because there was nothing to see. Not that it means anything anyway. Okay. Okay? Absolutely okay. It's your private business. If you want to tell your father what I didn't see, you will. If what I didn't see ever actually does mean something, then I encourage you to. He's not really the way he seems sometimes. You underestimate him. You always have. I underestimate him? Are you serious? He underestimates me. No, he doesn't. He's just a little afraid of you. Always has been. Afraid of me? Sure, Dad's afraid of me. He thinks you don't like him. He doesn't like me? You two are going to figure it out. I know you will. You're very much alike. You both feel things very deeply. Too deeply sometimes. Jude and I have quite a bit of armor on us. It takes a lot to break through it. Not you and Dad. We can talk more about this later, but I really do have to get ready. My doctor's appointment is in less than an hour. Noah gives her a knowing look. She's lying. He just heard her on the phone saying she's meeting Dad at the Wooden Bird. He doesn't know why she's lying to him, so he turns to leave. Everything's going to be okay. Noah, don't worry. Noah stops in his tracks and starts to turn around to face her, but stops himself. You know what? I really wish you'd stop saying that, Mom. Exterior. Sweet wine driveway. Later. Mom heads out the door with her bag and hops in her car. She turns on the engine as rain sprinkles down. She backs out of the driveway and the house is still for a moment, until Noah comes running out the front door. Exterior. Trails. Continuous. Noah is running through the light rain. He's out of breath but following Mom's car, which he can barely see through the trees. Exterior. Wooden bird. Continuous. Noah arrives at a clearing looking down on a humongous redwood stump carved into a bird, intricately detailed feather by feather. Mom gets out of her car and finds a bench near the bird and sits down, staring out at the sea. The sun's broken a hold in the fog and the light's reeling around in the trees. Suddenly there are footsteps. A man faces Mom, but she doesn't see him and Noah can't make out who he is. The man turns his head slightly and it's clear. It's Guillermo. When Mom sees him, she quickly gets up and falls into Guillermo's open arms. Noah takes a step back, almost pushed by the force of their embrace. Cut to. Flashback montage. Various. Noah connects each scene with this new reality, with each memory flashing quickly between him. Exterior. Guillermo's studio. Day. Noah spots Mom's car outside the studio and knocks on the window. You scared me, honey. Interior. Sweet wine house. Day. Noah and Jude stare at their parents, who sit opposite them. Your father and I, we... Exterior. Guillermo's courtyard. Day. Guillermo speaks on the phone before he heads back to his class. Hurry, hurry, my love! Cut to. Exterior. Wooden bird. Continuous. Guillermo and Mom stare into each other's eyes before kissing deeply. Nothing like how her dad used to kiss. Noah breathes unevenly, having a hard time with processing it in front of him. Mom grabs Guillermo's hand and brings him to the edge of the cliff, looking happier than ever. They stand on the edge of the bluff and kiss again, the waves crashing beneath and behind them. Noah gets up, unable to stand it anymore, and runs. Exterior. Woods. Continuous. Noah runs, panting, vision blurring. He stumbles a few times, unable to keep pace like he did when he was following Mom to the wooden bird. The forest moves past him in an endless bird. Blur. Noah's running home. Exterior. Street. Continuous. Noah heads up the last hill before hitting the street where he lives. When he emerges from the woods, he sees Brian and Courtney coming towards him. Brian's meteorite bag is wrapped around his shoulder and their arms are crisscrossed behind them. There's a smudge of bright color on Brian's lips, matching Courtney's preteen lip gloss. 
Noah is shaking, unable to process everything that happened in the last hour. He plants his feet and stares at Brian and Courtney, who are oblivious to his presence. He's gay, Courtney! Brian Conley is gay! Noah immediately realizes what he says as Brian's face goes blank before loathing takes over, and the air goes silent. Courtney's mouth slides open. She believes it. She steps away from him and looks at his face, which says it all. Brian is mortified, on the verge of tears, more betrayed than Noah ever was. Unable to take this in and unable to believe what he did, Noah bolts across the street to his house and races to his room, pulling out a sketch pad as he furiously starts drawing. End Act 3. Interior, Noah's room, later. Noah returns to the house after calming down and heads back into his room, where Mom is sitting there holding the drawing he left for her, of her and Guillermo kissing in front of the wooden bird in the foreground, and Dad, Jude, and Noah as one blur making up the background. Mom's mascara is smeared, making black tears. You followed me. I really wish you hadn't, Nona. I'm so sorry. You shouldn't have seen that. You shouldn't have been doing that! I know. Which is why... I thought you were going to tell Dad about me. That's why I followed you. I told you I wasn't going to. I heard you say on the phone something happened with Noah last night. I thought you were talking to Dad, not your boyfriend. Mom's face stiffens at the word. I said that because when I heard myself telling you last night that it was your responsibility to be true to your heart, I realized I was being a hypocrite. And I needed to take my own advice. I needed to be brave like my son. Mom stands and hands Noah the drawing. Noah, I'm asking Dad for a divorce. I'm going to tell him today. And I want to tell your sister myself. No! Don't you love us? I love you. I love nothing more than you and your sister. Nothing. And your dad is a wonderful, wonderful man. Is he going to live here, that man, with us? Is he going to sleep on dad's side of the bed, drink out of his coffee cup, shave in his mirror? Is he? Are you going to marry him? Is that why you want a divorce? Sweetheart. Mom touches Noah's shoulder, trying to comfort him. Noah pulls away from her. You are. You're going to marry him, aren't you? That's what you want. Mom doesn't say no, her eyes betraying her almost saying yes. So you're just going to forget about Dad? You're going to pretend everything you had with him is nothing? He won't survive it, Mom. You don't see him at the hotel. He's not like he used to be. He's broke. We tried. Dad and I, we've been trying very hard for a very long time. All I ever wanted for you kids was the stability I didn't have growing up. I never wanted this to happen. Mom sits back down next to Noah, who refuses to make eye contact, still fuming. But I'm in love with another man. I just am. I wish things were different, but they're not. And it is not right to live a lie. It never is, Noah. You can't help who you love, can you? The silence in the room is deafening. Neither knows what to say, but Mom stares desperately at Noah almost begging for his love. Noah almost cracks and tells Mom everything he wants to, that he's in love with Brian too, but he's betrayed Brian just like she betrayed Dad. Instead, he walks out of the room. Mom stays behind, left alone on Noah's bed as she starts to cry. She gets up and looks longingly at the family picture on Noah's desk. Interior, sweet wine house, continuous. Mom walks into the hallway, still crying. She looks around for Noah, who is nowhere to be found. Instead, she grabs her coat and car keys and walks outside. Exterior, sweet wine driveway, continuous. Mom unlocks her car and gets in, rain pouring down around her. Noah opens the front doors and sees her getting in the car. As mom starts the engine, Noah runs out after her, but mom begins backing the car out. Noah is stranded in the rain, shaking. I hate you! I hate you so much! Mom hits the brakes, looking at Noah shocked. Her eyes are huge, tears running down her cheeks. I love you. Mom puts her hand on her heart, then points at Noah, trying to get the words through the windshield and through Noah's armor. She continues backing out of the driveway. 
then out into the road. She takes one last look at Noah before driving off into the rain. I don't care! Interior. Sweet wine house. Later. One by one, Noah empties each tube of paint into the kitchen sink. The rainbow of paint turns into a mud color vomit. Noah mixes and mixes and mixes the paint, sinking his hands and arms into the cold, slippery, shining mush. As Noah is lost in the paint, the phone rings. He ignores it, but it rings and rings and rings and never seems to go to the answering machine. Noah heads to get the phone and wipes his hands on his shirt, but he still gets paint all over the phone. Is this the residence of Diana Sweetwine? Noah is confused and taken aback by the gruff voice on the other side of the phone. That's my mom. Is your father home, son? No, he doesn't live here now. Who is this? The man on the other side of the line goes silent. Noah knows there's something wrong. Is my mother okay? Noah runs to the window and looks out at the ocean, trying to spot Jude out surfing. She isn't there. Noah is growing more desperate. Did something happen? Please tell me. Is she okay? Please tell me she's okay. Can I have your father's cell phone number, son? What happened? You have to tell me what happened. How old are you? Is anyone with you? Noah is panicking, breathing loud and fast. It's only me here. I'm 14. Is my mom okay? You can tell me what happened. Noah looks down and sees that paint has dripped all over the floor like a multicolored blood. He's tracked it everywhere. There are handprints all over the window, the back of the couch, curtains, lampshades. I'm going to call your dad now. The officer hangs up, but Noah is unable to put the phone down. He stares out the window, feeling nothing. He starts dialing mom's cell phone, but is unable to push dial. Instead, he calls dad, whose phone goes to voicemail. Suddenly, Noah hears a skid in his driveway. He runs to the front window and sees his dad's car skidding up the driveway, followed by a police car. Dad runs into the house, and he doesn't have to say a word. Noah and dad crash together, falling to the ground, to their knees. Dad holds Noah's head to his chest, both hands. Oh, Noah, I'm so sorry. Oh, God. Noah, we, we have to get your sister. This is not happening. This is not happening. God. Noah pulls back from Dad and looks him right in the eyes. Then it happens. She was going to ask you to come home so we could all be a family again. She was on her way to tell you that. Dad pulls away, looking into Noah's burning face. She was? Noah nods and continues weaving his lie. Before she left, she said that you were the love of her life. Interior. Funeral home. Day. The Sweetwine family sits in the front row of the funeral home as the funeral comes to a close, dressed in typical funeral black. Jude on one side, Noah on the other. Jude cut her hair short, her hair not flowing off her head like it used to. The hall is filled with familiar faces. Brian and his mother sit in the last row, and as the funeral ends, he exits right away. Soon, Noah, Dad, and Jude are alone, as they will always be. Exterior, Guillermo's studio, day. Noah sits on the sidewalk the next day, whipping pebbles at the asphalt. In what seems like ages later, Guillermo crumbles out the doorway and up to the mailbox. He opens the little door and pulls out a bunch of letters. His face betrays his facade and shows he's been crying. Then he sees Noah. They're both staring at each other as Guillermo softly approaches. You look just like her. You have her hair. Noah tries to stand, but he's been sitting so long his legs give. Guillermo catches him and helps him sit back on the sidewalk. Hey. Noah bursts into tears, the first time since his mom died. Guillermo puts his arms around Noah and they feel each other shaking. Guillermo pulls Noah closer, onto his lap cradling him as the two cry together. Birds screech in the trees above them, and Noah pulls back. Guillermo can't hold him like this. He's the reason his mom is dead. Noah twists and wrangles himself out of the embrace. It's your fault she's dead. Guillermo's face crumbles. I blame you. She didn't love you. She told me she didn't. Guillermo continues crying, looking at Noah's face for the lie. She wasn't going to marry you. Noah slows down letting every word sink in. She wasn't going to ask my father for a divorce. She was on her way to ask him to come home.